Hello, everybody. I uh, hope you, that you are all well. Um, welcome and thank you for joining our webinar run in conjunction with the CIOB this evening. Uh, my name is Paul Gibbons and I am the founding director and chief executive of Decipher Consulting. The webinar today will look at technology and the future of construction dispute resolution. Uh, we have over uh, 100 registered for the event, uh, so I'm pleased to see that uh, people are getting access into the event as we speak. The webinar this evening will consist of two presentations. One will be by Ari Isaacs from ShapeDo. Ari will look at the latest technological developments that can help cut costs and improve control of design change. And the second presentation will be uh, held by Sean Murphy of, of Evidential. And we will discover how Evidential are using virtual reality to provide electronic presentation evidence in commercial and criminal hearings, which bring clarity to complex issues and reduce the costs of complex disputes. At the end of the session, there will be a panel discussion that will be facilitated by Jessica Stevens QC. And we would welcome any questions you may have. So please put these in the chat or the Q&A and we will facilitate those accordingly. I'm very pleased to be joined today with, as I say, Ari Isaacs from ShapeDo. Ari specializes in the interplay between technology and project controls in the construction industry. As ShapeDo's CEO, he has worked closely with major international projects, leveraging technology. He helps to analyze design change and liability throughout projects. His, philosoph his philosophy is that clear and tr transparent change management greatly mitigate risk and minimize disputes. Also, I'm joined by Sean Murphy of Evidential, who is the founder of Evidential based in Manchester, a leading expert witness and acclaimed specialist in the production of electronic presentation of evidence applications. Sean has worked for the UK's second biggest police force a multinational risk consultancy and now heads up Evidential Limited. And this evening we will discover how Evidential are using virtual reality to provide electronic presentation evidence in commercial and criminal hearings. On the panel discussion, as I say, I'm joined by Jessica Stevens QC, a barrister at Four Pump Court. Jessica is a specialist construction barrister named by the Times as one of the future stars of the bar. She has advised in and represented employers, contractors, professional advisors, local authorities and government, government departments in domestic and international disputes relating to the design and construction of buildings. Jessica was called to the bar in 2001 and became Queen's Council in 2019. She has been quoted as being a superb tactician, a sharp wit and excellent manner for cross-examination and an effective advocate who brings energy and steely determination. I'm also joined on a panel discussion by David Wintall, who's a partner at Hill Dickinson. David has over 30 years experience leading and is a leading construction solicitor based in the London office of a renowned law firm, Hill Dickinson. David has over 30 years working for a wide range of clients. His expertise and excellent client service is also reflected in, construction, in, in instruction by other law firms who do not have that expertise on behalf of their clients. David advises and helps clients mitigate and resolve disputes at adjudication, litigation, and other ADR processes. He also presents seminars and workshop in-house for clients and for other industry bodies, including the RICS, the CIOB, and FIS. Uh, FIS. Uh, David has been quoted as always being friendly and proactive, and we value his knowledge and expertise. And finally, I'm joined on the panel with Bill Bordill, a director here at Decipher Consulting. Bill is an experienced quantum expert and dispute resolver and an RICS adjudicator. He draws upon industry insight gained over three decades in senior positions with both contractor and consultant organizations. Bill is a discipline lead for quantity surveying within Decipher and combined with his role as an APC assessor for the RICS, Bill maintains a direct and an active involvement with current issues on live projects. So that's the panel uh, session and the, pres the presenters. I will now hand over to Ari to kick us off. So Ari, over to you, please. Can I just remind the, uh, the, present the other presenters to turn their cameras off and, their and to mute themselves whilst Ari's doing the presentation? 
Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, tall order. Uh, so uh, at ShapeDo, we are a software solution that does design change management. And I think the, the fundamental understanding behind the software is that if 10 projects go wrong, nine times in 10, it's to do with design. So there's either been too much change in the design um, or it just wasn't ready on time or it wasn't high enough specification. Uh, and as a result, if you can put, establish a really good baseline for design and then put strong controls every time there's a change um, and get a full audit trail of what that change means to a program cost delivery, uh, you'd be well on the way to delivering a successful project and delivering a project that everyone is happy with th their result within the project. Um, so looking at how this applies, uh, first of all, in dispute avoidance, uh, which is always best if you can put those controls in place from the beginning and just to deliver the project right, uh, primarily from a general contractor or a client's perspective, at least for this pre presentation. And um, so the idea is how do you put in place, uh, so the idea is to provide a software that helps you put in place strict controls um, for how design develops, how it changes, and what that means uh, to whom. So how does that look from a very practical nuts and bolts uh, perspective? So at the core of the software is a design comparison uh, technology. You can see a, a, a short animation of that here on the side. Um, it, it's essentially the equivalent of track changes in Word just for construction drawings. Um, and what that means is that the exercise of reviewing a drawing for a project manager, design manager, QS, um, instead of being a half hour, hour process that is erroneous, it becomes a two, three minute process, which is basically devoid of error. Um, and the significance of that is that it then becomes easy or reasonable to set a review process whereby every time a drawing is received or updated um, anywhere in the project, you, you can guarantee that the relevant people, so QS says design managers, project managers, are reviewing it uh, for everything in it within 48 or 72 hours. Um, and then attached to that, we, we also facilitate contractual forms and processes, so your RFIs, change orders, early warnings, and communications. Um, and what that means is that within 48 to 72 hours of receiving any new uh, iteration of design, um, you're going to have a full audit trail and analysis of what has changed, what it means for the projects, for the project, and what any future implications of that are going to be. I and mean, of course, that's integrated with all major, um, at least in the UK, uh, CDs and dot control systems. So this is readily available and deployed on multiple projects here in the UK and around the world. Um, so what's the benefits of that? Uh, the first and the most significant and also most significant in this context is the earlier identification of both technical and commercial issues. Um, so if you take any miscoordination, change, additional costs, something that will impact the program. If you can identify it at design stage, then it's either a quick fix or a conversation that can be had and can be solved for next to no cost and no contention. Um, as opposed to that, if it slips through the cracks as it often does and you hit it um, at the construction site or in retrospect, it easily becomes something that costs thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, and this happens hundreds and thousands of times in a construction project and the ability to identify it early, earlier is, is the main thing that de-risks the projects and reduce the cost. And um, the second thing is that you get much uh, quicker and much more efficient design development and just general utilization of the project staff and the design staff. Um, so, so what you get is, is you're able to solve more design issues per design iteration. You're going to, you're able to develop the design much faster and for less cost. Um, and what that means is that you will much more often hit the construction uh, the hit construction with construction ready design, uh, which again significantly de risks the project and makes you enables you to make decisions at construction phase 
at design phase rather than faced with constraints on site. And, and obviously that is a massive mitigation. Uh, first of all, on, of the risk itself, because if you're solving much more issues, um, you know, less risk accrue. But B, just the fact you're, even if there's something you won't be able to mitigate, the fact that you talk about it much earlier and are able to address it means it's much less likely to evolve into a dispute. Um, so just to put a pound sign against this, so this is a, a kind of amalgamation of case studies for a typical average industrial project or you know, sort of project you see um, performed by a tier one general contractor. Um, so if we look at the cumulative value of hundreds or thousands of details that will be overlooked in design typically today and hit in construction phase and the value of identifying and solving them e earlier, it's a massive value in the context of the project. If we look at the, uh, at the value of being 5, 10, 20% more efficient in design development. It's a priceless improvement in the efficiency of the of um, a project. Um, so, if you're running projects, yeah, you know, in the, at the beginning, at their middle, we're able to implement this, you know, establish a baseline and go from there on. And um, but what if you know you already reached the end of uh, the project and um, alas, the dispute did occur. Um, so, so I think it's we're still able to essentially emulate the same process because ultimately what happens in many disputes, if not all of them, is that you're you're kind of retrospectively going through the steps of the process and trying to understand what went wrong, where were the critical changes, where were the critical misses, and as a result, why hopefully your client isn't liable. Um, so. How does that look on a, again, on a nuts and bolts kind of uh, way? Um, so the first is that we have a lot of experience in e-discovery e and overhead reduction, um, as, as well as quite a few specific technologies because we, we've faced this multiple times. Um, so basically when you get to that stage where there's, you get dumped with a massive disclosure with 100,000 or 500,000 documents, and you need to just, create order in the chaos, understand what came first, what came second, what documents matter, what documents don't matter. And um, we're, we're able to process those much faster and much more efficiently than anywhere anyone else out there because we can fit them into the template of how that will evolve along the, the project. And um, second of all, uh, and probably the most important, is that in a design um, heavy dispute or in any sort of main uh, delay dispute, the, the experts and the site team will have to be retrospectively running through thousands, tens of thousands of drawings to understand the evolution of the project, to understand that in conjunction with the evolution of the program and to substantiate some sort of narrative or story of what went, went wrong. Um, so the ability to review the progress of a drawing in two minutes instead of an hour becomes extremely pronounced when um, you're looking at expert fees or you're looking at the time limitations in a case. Um, and you, you would like to be able to fairly review thousands or tens of thousands um, of drawings within a month. And th this becomes a decisive factor in the ability to really on this, get to the crux of what happened in the project and better understand it. Um, and finally, the same tools that are used prospectively um, to cost and to explain um, why delays occur, or why there are issues, are extremely effective in tying together the design evolution and design change and tying it into program delays into cost into cost implications and etc um, so that you're not only as an expert understanding what's happening and um, but also as an expert as a solicitor or as a, a client organization able to put that into compelling narratives that you can easily submit uh, in front of a tribunal and um, so, so that you're, you're going much further with that case. Um, so a couple of sort of um, 
you know, in, insofar as one is allowed to disclose sort of kind of what happened stories. Um, so this is ranging all the way from extremely complex mega projects with nine and ten figure disputes all the way down to everyday occurrences in almost every project. So three stories. And um, so the first is in a this is a reasonably big project that was going on for almost a decade. It had a change of contractor in the middle, very complex design evolution, very complex kind of story behind the dispute. And it had a brewing dispute over about over circa six months of delay on site, um, with, with the crux of which was design change. Um, and it was going to be quite fundamental to the contractor's balance sheet. Um, and what happened actually is when they put this on the software and they saw exactly what was changed when, uh, this actually became not a dispute because they were able to show to the client exactly what was evolved and who changed what when, um, such that they were basically paid in full without this evolving into a dispute. And I think that's that that's one of those kind of lovely cases where just crystallizing exactly what happened just tells you the story and then it, it becomes quite clear what is go what who is in the right or how the how the ball needs to fall. Uh, the second case is um actually a retrospective study done with uh, a large expert uh, company um, and, and this was done on a major major oil and gas dispute where hundreds of thousands of isometrics were actually reviewed by experts at expert fees. Um, and putting it through the software, they were able to A, eliminate 96% um, of the drawings that they actually did review in retrospective. So, so, so this isn't, you know, a guess that they actually reviewed those drawings. 96% of those were effectively duplicates and the software was able to eliminate them. So they would have been 25 times more efficient in that exercise had they been using the software. And then the, the additional review on top of that was measured to be fourfold as uh, effective. So this would have been reflected in millions and millions of savings in expert fees. And, but more importantly, they'd be able to do a much more robust review much faster and spend the same time and money on actually building the case and what was a very, very substantive um, case and that is important and worth it. And the final case is, is much more of the sort of bread and butter comes around every day. Um, so, so literally just a general contractor at the end of, the pro at the end of a project, um, the team loaded all the information onto shape do and we're able to compare the first version and the last version isolate any change that wasn't accounted for and then go through those changes and see if any of those were a result of a request by a client or something that you know came from one of the designers or subcontractors or basically anything they could get paid for um, and they were able to add another 1.5 percent of revenue onto the project or almost 500,000 pounds in a matter of a two day exercise and completely change the bottom line of that project. So that's a, a major win on a everyday basis available pretty much to you know, every project. Um, again, we, we are able and we do get involved in very complex claims, but it's worth saying that for certain sort of templates or type of claims, um, it, it's almost a production line at this point. You know, so if you need to go through a final accounts exercise, you will almost certainly be able to get a stronger position by knowing exactly what changed between the tender documents and the as-built documents. Um, and, and that's a two, three day exercise on almost every project a week on the really big one. If you have a consultant that you feel has been negligent in their practice, putting together a template claim that says, here are X occurrences of changes in which the consultant did A, B, C, D, which is against, um, which is against accepted practices or a contract. That is something we can do in a matter of days and not a large cost. If you get an unfair claim or unsubstantiated claim sent your way 
and you need to quickly review the evidence on the main drawings in the main drawings in order to bring forward a counterclaim or just show that it's that, that it's made out of air. That is a very fast and reasonably easy experiment. So for some of these experiments um, or, or for some of these processes, it, it's a very fast, very simple case. Of course, when you get up to the 10 to the eight, nine and 10 figure disputes with a lot of complexities, um, you know, we, we're happy to do that too. Um, so to summarize, uh, I, I believe we'll be sending out um, some information about the company. Um, I'm here to answer any questions. Uh, I think in general, any project um, can benefit from much better, much tighter uh, design change management. And uh, of course, if it ends up in a dispute, then forensically going through the same uh, process produces quite a strong um, advantage. So that's me. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Ari. Uh, that was really informative and, and, and a nice tease in terms of what ShapeDo can do. I think it's quite pleasing also for me to see how your product can simplify um, what's out there in terms of disputes and some of those case studies there and the savings that were made is quite enlightening really in terms of how, how that technology can be used to, to, to simplify the message. Um, so really good. And I'm, I'm waiting to hear um, some of the questions and answers on the panel discussion to see how it really does work in practice and what issues there may well be. So thanks for that. So moving on now to, to Sean. So Sean's going to uh, give us a presentation on uh, virtual reality. So over to you, Sean, please. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks a million, Paul. Uh, thank you, Bill, as well, and Stuart, for, and everyone at Decipher for uh, kindly inviting me. And thanks to everyone who's come on to the event tonight, uh, you know, at the end of your working day and just before you have some food. So appreciate uh, you sticking around. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my business, Evidential. Um, so we're primarily expert witnesses in a number of different fields. Um, idea, normally in the criminal justice system, but we're actually um, expanding out beyond that nowadays um, in various disputes on the civil litigation side as well. Um, but the key thing I'm going to talk about is electronic presentation of evidence. Um, this is um, what we specialize in. Uh, we've been around for a number of years now. We're independent expert witnesses, so we work for both prosecution and defense. Um, and our kind of regular work comes from people like the Crown Prosecution Service or the Serious Fraud Office. And you can see there are a few of the different kind of forensic disciplines that we, uh, we specialize in. To give you an idea, here's our kind of roll call of some of the cases that we've worked on in the past. Um, once again, hopefully you'll recognize quite a few of these. Um, and, um, and yeah, they, they're fairly high profile cases, both in the UK and abroad. Um, one that I'm very proud of is a United Nations investigation we worked on, uh, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. And these pictures are the before and after of this incident where the um, Prime Minister of Lebanon was assassinated in um, a car bomb attack. And you can see that all the vehicles in the top picture are now just crumpled meshes in the bottom picture and some of the buildings surrounding were, were demolished at the same time. Um, a very unusual case. I'm very proud to have worked over in the, in the United Nations um, arena for that. Um, what we do, we get involved in these big cases and, and we kind of um, provide a, a graphic design slant to it. We, we, we try and simplify complex evidence by using multimedia, using graphics so people can understand the evidence in a much better format. Um, so we're, we're about producing reconstructions, for instance. So um, this is an actual uh, murder case that I'm showing you in Sheffield, which happened in a nightclub. Um, uh, the case itself went to court a good year and a half afterwards. So the nightclub no longer existed. So it was difficult to bring the judge and the jury to back to the crime scene. Um, so we re reproduced this from some of the photographs that were taken by the police the next day. Um, and it was important to show the dance floor and the DJ booth. So this is where it happened and, and where the, the actual weapon was found. But then other elements were important as well. So these steps had blood splatter on them. There was further blood splatter on the floor in the nightclub around here. And then another key element of the um, evidence to explain to people was a palm print that was found on that wall there before the people left 
the uh, the place. So um, this is just one element of a number of things that we get involved in. So um, we use little tools like laser scanning, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, um, to actually reproduce these sort of places with high amounts of accuracy. Um, this example is BBC Broadcasting House, where the accuracy of the scan is within five millimeters in particular. Um, and we can utilize this to show where certain people were, where they weren't, or what they could see or what they couldn't see. Um, and we get involved in road traffic incidents, once again, doing laser scanning to ensure the accuracy. Um, and we look at all the various different types of um, presentation capabilities that are out there. So that could be 3D printers using them so that people can understand methods in particular, um, or maybe drone cameras, for example. And this led us to the world of virtual reality. Um, and I'd like to just um, show you a few examples. I must admit, it's very difficult to show uh, virtual reality in its best light um, over a Zoom call like this. Uh, normally, we'd ask you to come to our office and put a headset on, and uh, you would completely get it. You'd, you'd be immersed in it fully. So hopefully, you'll have to use a, a little bit of imagination tonight to actually understand um, how this fits into what you're doing. Um, and to give you an idea, this was one of our early prototypes um, where my colleague was using the VR headset um, to explore the area and learn about various bits of information that were in there um, and get a spatial identification as to where things were in relation to various bits of evidence. Um, so this is one of our very early, I'm, I'm, I'm grimacing a little bit, I must admit, at some of the quality of the graphics. It's, it's one of the prototypes. Um, but hopefully you can see kind of the benefits of, of exploring this in its area. And um, there are some key benefits when it comes to virtual reality. Um, this was a, a report done by PricewaterhouseCooper, where it understood that uh, it, it was considered to be 400% more effective and people retain that information in a much greater effect as well. Um, we've got the benefit of being able to join people together. So um, Myself, could be, I'm based in Manchester, and someone based in London can put the headsets on and explore the same scene together. Um, that can happen across the world or just within the next room. So we can have more than one person in more than different, more than several locations, all interacting together at the same time. There is a relatively co small cost in comparison to what this would normally consider to be used for, and therefore huge savings at the end of the day. So I just want to show you a few examples that if you were to put the headset on, um, this is the sort of feeling that you would get. This is uh, an airport situation where we've um, provided um, the ability for people to feel the huge scale of a plane going past them. And please be aware, you know, this is Manchester Airport who we're utilizing this with at the moment. They're using it for, for doing training in security. So um, Manchester Airport would regularly shut down one of the actual um, runways um, they said about four or five times a year to train various people in various incidents um, they believe that using the virtual reality headsets would stop them from cutting it uh, closing the runway as, as often that they could try it in a virtual world over and over again and then perhaps only cut shut down the runways a couple of times a year instead um, the beauty of it is we can control the conditions as well so we've got an example here where we've got different weather conditions compared to what you saw before. We can control the time of day, the, the various weather conditions, and we can throw different aspects in it. So in this particular instance, you need uh, to use tools to actually wander around the place. Um, and you can interact with the doorways and, and make your way around this, um, this scene in particular. And uh, as you wander around, you just get a much better understanding of where everything was located when you compare it to maybe a video or the use of a plan drawing. And just going back to another example for you. So this time we're, we're going back to our roots, um, my old force, Greater Manchester Police, where I used to work, um, and exploring the actual uh, insides of a building this time around, um, insides of a premises. And in this particular example, we're looking at the various pieces of evidence that are laid around. Um, so we can pick up all these. It's, everything's interactable. We can explore the different cupboards. 
as you can see we've got a crime scene box here where we're going to put some markers down so people could understand various elements of it we can also use specialist tools within there um, so we've got a camera capability so you can take photographs as you go along and store them on a tablet at the end of the day um, or you can use specialist tools like uh, the ultraviolet light that's being demonstrated at the moment So a further example for you, um, recently we've been working with British Transport Police on a particular um, scenario for those guys. And uh, this time we're introducing uh, people within the action um, so that you can wander around and understand how the most movement of people and the corralling of people away from an incident as well, um, how they get involved in the various aspects of it. Another video coming up for you. As I said, it's very hard to explain how this feels when you've got the headset on, but you do actually move out the way of that train when it comes flying past you. Um, it's that realistic that you kind of, the brain gets fooled into it. Um, and a, just a few more examples here of incidents that we've worked on, uh, road traffic incidents, for example. Uh, once again, where we can change the various conditions from, from daytime to different weather conditions to the various nighttime conditions. And I, I recall showing this to Paul at Decipher and his colleagues um, a little while ago, and they saw great benefits in, in the use of this uh, going forward for some of their cases where we can quickly prototype the various elements that are happening, perhaps in a dispute, where if one particular element occurs, then there's a, a knock-on effect, and people are completely immersed in the situation and understand the, uh, the seriousness of the matter. And just for a bit of a light relief, I guess, in a way, we've also uh, exploring the ideas of using augmented reality for different aspects as well. Um, a completely different way of looking at it. So instead of being fully enclosed in a, a 3D headset, um, this time you use goggles and you interact with various elements um, while still in the room as well. We're constantly, um, well, we're actually being funded by the government to look at uh, various use of augmented reality. Um, so things like tactical tables, uh, the military are particularly interested in using this element at the moment so that groups of people can uh, surround a table and dynamically interact with, with what they have on the show. Um, and uh, just as, as a side bet, you know, we're showing uh, the first responder project, which is another way of co-locating and sharing data between people so in this instance the police officer uh, walks around a new crime scene whereas the expert is still back at base and can liaise with that person on a very um, quick basis so instead of waiting for these people to attend the crime scene for several hours um, in these instances they are instantly transported to the crime scene within minutes and able to review what's happening and make some strategic decisions as well so um, thank you for listening to my talk today. Um, and uh, if you want to find out some more information, there's a, a website down there. Um, and I look forward to hopefully answering some of the questions that you might have. Thank you. Thanks for that, Sean. Um, I, I must say, I, I have had, the, as, as Sean's already mentioned, the uh, virtual uh, headset on. And it is amazing experience. And you do feel as if you're actually at the the place and or the crime scene or, or physically in this instance you know the construction matter the construction site and i'm intrigued to, to understand more how um evidentials virtual world can also assist in our world of dispute resolution as particularly to support the tribunals in understanding complex uh, high-rise buildings um you know complex construction sites uh, to bring it to life in a, in, a, in a controlled environment to allow the tribunal to understand rather than working with 2D models, working in a, in a virtual world reality. Um, so thanks for that, Sean. Uh, and that, I'm go now going to hand over to uh, Jessica to uh, chair a panel discussion um, between us all. So Jessica, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you. Ari and Sean, um, thank you for that. It's it's interesting to see what the um, what the platforms can do. But are you able to um, give us some examples of the use that um, forensic consultants that ordinarily sort of act in construction disputes before court or an arbitration tribunal? Are you able to sort of talk us through what use they've been able to make of the platforms? 
obviously suitably anonymized if possible. Um, Aria, I, I don't mind going first. Um, so Jessica, I, I forgot to mention that we worked on the Hillsborough trial last year, which was a part of criminal trial, admittedly, for all the incidents that happened with the Liverpool fans. But it was also a health and safety uh, trial as well. So there was an awful lot of um, engineering about the number of people that should have been in the ground at that point in time. Um, and we, we were using um, 3D representations of the ground so that people could understand the various ins and outs of the ground and how people flow could happen and uh, some of the kind of issues that surrounded uh, in particularly an incident that was now 30 years old as well um, and uh, we've been approached I, I can't show too much about um, using the similar sort of thing on the Manchester Arena bombing um, and some of the terrorist incidents in the in the um, in London as well uh, along with the Grenfell inquiry so we're kind of finding that our work is is kind of becoming a, a, a hybrid of the two uh, between health and safety issues and criminal matters at the same time. Yeah, I mean, you can certainly see, particularly with COVID restrictions, I guess you can certainly see how it might save um, sort of in-person physical site visits if there were a sort of virtual reconstruction of what it is you're going to look at. And also, I guess, if you've got some sort of engineering dispute, you can sort of see how the moving parts were supposed to move together and, you know, where the defect is. You, you can see um, how it might be um, applied. And Ari, I guess you're coming at it from a slightly different sort of uh, perspective. Your platform aims to identify changes um, from the drawings. So, uh, can you, you gave us three um, case studies. Were they case studies in which you engaged or you assisted, say, a delay expert or a quantum surveyor in producing their evidence? I'm, I'm just sort of keen yeah. to understand where your platform fits in the sort of so, traditional dispute resolution. So, so it typically happens in one of two ways uh, that we get involved in disputes. The first is, um, that we'd be working with the general contractor or the client representative as our client as it goes along, right? And then there's a matter that's escalated and we sort of can give them some additional help in framing their case or framing their argument slightly more succinctly. Um, and that tends to be a much more minor intervention. The, the second type where it tends to happen is you've got a project that's it's probably already completed or near enough completed. Um, you get, by this point, there's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of documents. There are multiple systems. Um, so maybe uh, you already have solicitors and experts uh, who have been brought onto the project. Um, so you have a, a contractor's team or a client's team working off a, a CD. And then separately, you have relativity or something like that for the solicitor, um, which is how it's been disclosed. Um, and then maybe the expert has their own idea of how they're going to manage the information. Um, and the truth is that the people that built it have long since gone. And you know everyone's in the room looking at all this information and saying, we think we're right. But why are we right? How are we right? We've all been in that situation, right? Um, right, yeah, so, so what the way we typically approach that is, is, you know, we do kind of the same thing an expert would do is like try and get a, a, a an idea of what's going on. And assuming it's design related, what we'd be able to do is take all of the documents from everywhere and um, filter them into our uh, platform, looking at document IDs, date stamps from the metadata, but also with specific OCR for construction documentation. Um, and then in the first instance, give you a, a clear progression of how every document went from A to B to C to E to F um, to start with, at what date, by you, whom. You just said that I, I probably misunderstood, but it's not simply sort of revision one to revision two and identify the changes. It, it, can you pick up more changes, for example, from meeting minutes and things like that, or, you know, requests? So the, those typically need to be tied in, right? Like yeah. the reality of the big construction disputes is that it's all connected 
and that no one has any idea how when you on the onset, right? So the first stage is actually just understanding what document was received when, by whom, uh, and very often that that's actually the crux of the case. Mm-hmm. Um, but then beyond that, once you've done that, it becomes reasonably easy or reasonably cheap for the client team or for the expert to then say, okay, so the the main issues were the structure or the main issues was the interface between the retained facade and, and um, you know, and the m and or whatever it is. What are the documents that describe that? So what are the site meetings, RFIs, and um, and drawings that that um, that describe that? Get all of those on a clear timeline, right? So that when you're referencing the the, the critical program delays, when you're re- when you're referencing the critical meetings, when you're referencing the critical RFIs, you can see the interplay between the design development and those, mm-hmm. and then put those all in, put all of those in sort of in order such that it becomes clear what actually happens. Um, and you can do that in a matter of hours or days, as opposed to being a, you know, months and months exercise that but, often never actually happens. Yeah. And um, I mean, I'm, I've been doing this for sort of 20 years now. And I think the, the, the message I get each and every case I do is the importance of records, the importance of records, the importance of records. And I guess what you're saying is you, you do need some sort of, you need some documents to make a start. Do you see um, sort of any, any potential or are there any sort of platforms available in terms of helping contractors keep records in a way that assists this process? I mean, look, in an ideal world, you'd be in from day one and everybody would be, you know, keeping records in the format that you need and it would all go swimmingly. You would hope, but I mean, in the real world, you've got people scribbling on drawings and you know, left, right, and centre. How how do you see the the record keeping, both in terms of design changes and I think critically, it's the next step. Well, what was the impact of the design change on the project? How do you see this sort of technology, other sort of developing forms of technology, helping? both clients and, and contractors in that situation? So, so I mean, uh, I think the, the the first thing is that once you've spilled the milk, you know, the hoovering it up back into the glass isn't going to be 100% efficient. Mm. Um, and, and something we see very often is that we help a client or a general contractor in a dispute, and then they instruct us to be there from the beginning with every next project, right? Because And the two things actually inform each other because I think the way you manage the project should be aligned to what can go wrong, which is what happens in disputes. So actually approaching the same problem of the design change from both how do you stop it breaking in the first place and how do you pick up the pieces if it breaks is a really effective um, sort of interplay. Um, So so yes, we're obviously able to do much more if we're there from the start. Um, on the second question, so the, there, there is actually quite a lot of good news there, right? Um, because A, you know, if you look at the disputes that sort of happened 10 years ago, very often it comes down to literally printed uh, documents with scribbles on them that we can process, but to a lesser degree of our accuracy, and it takes a bit more work to get it all aligned. Um, we cut our teeth on those, right? So that's that's kind of where we started in your, you know, oil rigs and mines out in the middle of nowhere built 20 years ago. And that's just how their records are. So we we can, we've learned how to deal with those. But the good news is that most disputes coming in now and going in forwards do have digital systems, have been at some point um, created in a BIM environment or shared on some sort of common data environment. Um, so the information is there in the metadata or in the drawings, or at least on the drawings. And it's just a matter of sort of applying a, a, 
a mind, or in this case, a software, to aggregating all of that put together and putting it into a template that's comprehensible. So the good news is that in the vast majority of cases, with a reasonable amount of work or quite a small, you know, anything between small and medium amount of work, you can actually take a mess coming from a few systems and with various things and put it into the order you'd want. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you see this as being, if you like, it's an additional aid for the existing delay and quantum experts rather than a replacement? Oh yeah, we, we have no opinions about you know, construction or engineering. Yeah. yeah we're, we're... And, and what about the sort of practical considerations? I know you said you know it, it was reasonably cheap and we've two days work and the rest of it. I mean, re realistically in, in percentage terms as a, you know, as a, as a percentage of the build costs, for example, if you were there from day one monitoring, what sort of percentage would it add to the, the costs of a project? I, I, the parts we can measure tend to be kind of between two and 5% um, uh, is sort of a, a rough estimate. Yeah. And, and presumably in the same way as, you know, traditionally you'd sort of spend money having an architect to resolve problems on site rather than doing it yourself when you got back from work. Um, it, it, it's an investment that pays off because problems are generally, you would hope, picked up. Yeah, uh, and I mean, it, it, tends to, it tends to pay for itself reasonably fast. Um, so uh, an example of this, and actually how we got one of our first large appointments before we you know, were, were anywhere or anything or had the references to do this kind of job. Yeah. Um, it, so, so this was a rail job and we were looking, um, we managed to convince a project director in, in a large um, underground station, not in this country, uh, to, to give us a few example drawings to you know, show what the technology does. Um, and in that demo, uh, we identified a diaphragm wall uh, that was 24 meters across, 26 meters down, all in problematic environment. So, so quite a, a complex diaphragm wall that between a, a tender version and a version novated to a contractor was changed from 120 mil to 150 mil mm -hmm. um, and was overlooked by the contractor. Yeah. Um, so in that demonstration alone, it was six figures worth of savings that they knew for a fact they've already written off. They were already building to the new documentation and they were never asking. For it. Yeah. Um, so, and, I mean, I, I guess it can identify a change and it can then lead, if you like, to a sort of line of inquiry as to why that change was made. It doesn't necessarily thinking with you know all the issues that might arise on a project doesn't necessarily mean right there's a change there's more money involved it but but it does at least identify that something has happened and people can then investigate why that has happened and which party bears responsibility for it um sean i, I i'm interested in your um thoughts on the next point which is um Lots of tribunals, I mean, sometimes less so arbitral tribunals than, you know, judicial tribunals, um, you know, not perhaps the most modern of individuals. They're getting better. Most of them can now manage a Skype hearing with yeah. or without the assistance of their clerk. But um, how, how do they respond to this technology? Um, it, it, like, I've been doing this 20 years myself, uh, Jessica, and... and I do see a massive shift change in, in those who are using technology now. Um, the kind of a certain generation has gone away where they, they were asking, well, what is a computer almost? Um, and we're now getting a generation that is almost reliant on these things. As you said, an awful lot of barristers have had to learn the best way of doing um, virtual hearings over the last few months as well. So um, we are becoming more and more reliant on it. The actual, um, the judiciary themselves are being for use of a better word, forced to use technology. Um, the Inland Revenue did a, a few um, tests on a traditional trial compared to um, a, an electronic presentation trial. 
and realized that it had a third time savings, mm -hmm. uh, which equated to quite a significant amount of money on, on some of these kind of large serious fraud office kind of cases. Yeah. Um, so it's for those who are not tech savvy, they're having to be tech savvy, but we're coming across more and more um, council who, who embrace technology nowadays. Um, so yeah, uh, brings yeah. it on basically. Well, yeah, I, and I think, you know, the events of this year have sort of given us all a, a shove, whereas we might previously have been a, a little more resistant. Yeah. Um, what about this? Just you can sort of see, and it all sounds great, but what if somebody were to sort of, if you like, challenge the product of these platforms? I think it's probably more one for you, Ari on the basis of well, what's what what what's the underlying sort of coding what's the algorithms you're using and they decided to sort of take an issue with the product you know they can see what's gone into it and they can see what's come out of the process but they're nevertheless not going to accept that that is if you like the only outcome and they want to have a dispute about the process um, how have you come across that at all or and if you did how do you see that being resolved um so she says what, showing a complete lack of knowledge of how these no, things work no it's uh, <laughs> it, it, it makes perfect sense um so the dispute part we, we tried to immunize the dispute part of our product from this to start with so in an ongoing basis, we'll have these kind of nice recommendations of maybe you want to look at this, maybe you want to do that, to come in as part of the software. But when it's used for a dispute, we're very careful to just not have an opinion about anything. So, you know, this is the document, this is where its state comes from, that's either okay or not. This is the next document, you know, here you're flipping between the next two. We didn't add any opinion into that process. All we're doing, is giving the expert the platform to say A, B, ergo C. So we're not actually adding any information or opinion, and therefore it's essentially immune from that process attack that you might get from sort of aggregate data or that you may have experienced on sort of more um, word-oriented word e-discovery tools. Yeah. Okay, so basically it would still come down to what you're effectively doing is highlighting and then it's for the experts to provide the opinion. <clears throat> is yeah, that right? Exactly. exactly. Okay. Um, David Bill, sorry, we've, um, what, what do you think of all of this? What role do you think this technology might have going forwards and ha have you used it? Do you see it working? Do you see it? David, do you want to go first? Common. Well, um, Picking up on uh, Ari's initial observations and presentations, um, clearly we've seen uh, dispute resolution processes uh, most impacted by um, technology in the field of disclosure uh, uh, and disclosure of documents to other parties that uh, are in dispute. Of course, that's less relevant to the question of adjudication, uh, which um, tends to be resolved on a documents only basis and without formal disclosure uh, procedures. Um, where we've seen uh, increasing use of uh, technology, uh, and of course the construction industry has over the past couple of years seen much greater adoption of building information modeling. Um, and um, Bill, Paul, you can speak about this, but we are seeing more delay analysis uh, by experts around incorporating use of building information modeling so, so that experts' opinions can be presented in a way that's consistent with project methodology uh, uh, and in a very much more graphically easily understood uh, means of presentation. That, that's the first point I'd make. Uh, and the second point, and uh, uh, it's a trend, I think, coming over the horizon because we've seen increased use of technology having some success in Australia, but there are a couple of technologies starting to be used in the construction industry using cloud-based software concerning the processing of applications for payment and payment notices. 
between main contractor and subcontractor and, and the supply chains. Um, uh, clearly, uh, payment disputes are, are of primary concern to the industry. Um, and uh, if there can be greater use of collaborative platforms that allow contractors, subcontractors and consultants to prepare, submit, assess, review and certify applications for payment, then I think that will greatly ease uh, the process uh, and uh, much reduce the scope for dispute. Uh, where, as Jessica, you will know, and many of the audience will know, disputes tend to arise because payment notices aren't given on time or they're deficient in some way. And if that process can be automated, then that greatly reduces the uh, prospect and scope for further dispute and therefore save contractors in the supply chain very significant time and cost. Bill, what would you like to add to that? So I think the old adage of um, a picture paints a thousand words is prevalent here. It's very easy for people to understand. They'll still get the tome of words, the big narrative document that explains all the intricacies and complexities, but a picture that shows them what actually happened. We could show graphically or pictorially what should have happened and then what did happen with a time lapse would actually calibrate people's minds so that when they read the documents, they can take it all, take all the detailed information on board and understand it. Um, so that, that should speed up the whole process. But just to contextualize this for, for anybody who's not particularly involved in disputes, um, all tribunals make decisions based on evidence. And evidence comes from good records, which, which is why, Jessica, you said the old Max Abraham, Abrahamson records, records, records. Um, they have to be good records. And if the contemporaneous records are made at the time and ideally shared with the other party at the time, it's very difficult to refute that evidence later. So I was just thinking of, a, of an application that we could have almost instantly. And, and that is most of the larger sites have my biometric gate entry systems. So those systems record from the site induction records, the name of an operative, what his trained skill is, and therefore what he should be doing on the site. Um, daily, the biometric records, which are either fingerprints or retina recognition, will record the time that the operative spent on the site. But if those records were codified in such a way that they also identified what location the operative worked on the site and also what task he undertook, i.e. the activity from the, the contract program, then all of a sudden we've digitally created a fantastic record that it would be very, very difficult to disprove later. So there's an, an, an it can't be, I've never seen this happen, but it can't be beyond the wit of man to bring this uh, into, into fruition almost tomorrow. That, that should be an easy thing to do. It should be an easy thing to do, but I mean, you know, we've all been to sites and they're not often the most sort of technologically advanced places. What would we do to encourage, um, you know, contractors, subcontractors to make use of this sort of technology? Well, I think, I think the real failing that we see regularly in, in claims is that they're not properly supported because the contractors don't have the records. Um, so if the records could be produced almost for them and all they've got to do is check and edit what, what a system produces, um, that would be an easy way of doing it. So, so the, 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 the records for each operative on a site could be programmed with where that operative is to work and what his tasks are for certain days or certain weeks. And then if at the end of each day, the site manager only had to run down or the section leader, someone in responsibility only had to run down the list of people that he was responsible for and either tick, approve or correct the record that's come out of the system. I think we've got a very workable way forward. Yeah. Um, they will, they will okay. get records by default. Right, just running through some of the questions Sorry. from the audience. Yeah. David, I think this is probably one from me or you, we've only got a few minutes to go. Um, question, how would a tribunal treat an evidential simulation as evidence, i.e. what's the forensic value of it? Now, my view would be probably in a similar way to how they would treat a site plan or something like that as useful insofar as it goes and until it's challenged as being incorrect 
I, I would guess, rather than it being sort of evidential as as such. I mean, you know, certainly you can see Sean's presentations, how you know, I can imagine and how they would work on cases I've got at the moment. But I, I guess what a tribunal would make of them very much depends upon what what how I wanted to rely on it and what I wanted the tribunal to take from it, which I think would be a sort of, you know, shortcut guide to this is what we're talking about. Um, rather than this is evidence of something. Uh, what about you, David? Yes, I, I'd agree. I think um, it would be viewed very much in that light, but it's got to be seen in context of other evidence and the extent to which humans can actually speak to it uh, and utilise it to, to help prove and establish uh, what ultimately needs to be proved. So yeah. it's an important part of the jigsaw, but only one piece. Yeah, it's a presentation of the evidence that's there. And I think if you haven't got the underlying evidence to support it, or there is a dispute about the underlying evidence that, you know, what it's depicting, how accurate it is, then, you know, I guess it would stand or fall on, on that. Right, there's a really technical one here. I am literally going to read it because it's meaningless to me. How can blockchain technology improve contract administration? Ari's smiling. He looks like the only person who recognises that means something. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it won't, <laughs> is, the, is the short answer. Um, basically, blockchain is a technology where the fundamental trade-off um, is that you spend a lot of technical... It, it's a computer protocol, like HTTPS or anything of that nature. And the fundamental trade-off is you, that you spend a lot of uh, computer resources in order to not rely on a central authority of records. Um, so in an example of money, which is the killer use case for blockchain or what, what's called Bitcoin, that's really important because if you're a pirate or someone that doesn't like the global and national banks around the world are debasing their currency, and then having a form of money not reliant on a central authority that says who owns it is very important. So it's a trade-off that is valuable. However, in a construction site, the the this um, the, the disbelief or the lack of trust between clients and contractors has not gotten to a stage where you need an independent authority um, in order to say that things have happened. Like we generally trust email. And um, so there's no additional value to blockchain. Yeah. Like the, the fundamental trade-off in the technology has no advantages and multiple um, costs. And um, okay. there are a lot of technologies actually not using blockchain, but trying to ride on the wave of what it means to have smart contracts. Okay, um, I'm going to stop you there. Two, two reasons. One, we're out of time. The other, I'm out of my depth. Um, Sean, uh, Paul, David, Bill, anything to add before we before we wind up? Just, just one thing for me. Um, Ari, you were mentioning before, just very quickly, about the 2 to 5% uh, of the cost of shape, uh, the cost of the product for shape do. Can you just explain just very quickly, is that 2% two to 5% of the bill cost? Yeah, roughly. Yeah, that's the, that, that's the general scope. So if you sort of look at the total waste streams in a project, looking at between 30 and 60% um, of a project is generally waste uh, due to various inefficiencies and disputes and et cetera. Um, you know, you, you can't get all of that, but you can dig into it. So two to 5% of the build cost is sort of the, the upper limit of uh, what can be done by doing things properly. Super. Or at least the upper limit we've experienced. Super. Okay, there's one more question I will, I will ask and then we can all, all head off. Um, I think one for Sean um, from Michael Worrell, who asks, have you been asked to look at the application of AI in the social housing sector? He says it could be great for prospective tenants who are often vulnerable to view properties virtually instead of having to make a difficult or time-bound visit. Also for contract spec refurbishments or alterations, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I'll, I'll try to be brief, Jessica, because everyone's dinner's ready. Yeah. Um, so we've got two similar projects, Michael. Thank you for the great question. Um, the first one uh, is about 
related to what you're saying about vulnerable adults and children um, accessing areas prior to actually visiting somewhere. Um, so there's some great studies around autistic children um, who have trouble going into new places that if they explore it in a virtual world first, they feel so much more comfortable um, going into that place um, in real life. Um, and then just very quickly on the second one, um, we're also working on a project where um, we're using virtual reality to design out crime as well. So if um, certain buildings have altered different lighting, for example, um, there's there's more chance of crime, or sorry, less chance of crime happening in those areas. Excellent. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Jessica. No worries. So apologies, everybody, just slightly running over, but so hopefully, hopefully you've enjoyed the webinar. It's, uh, it's fascinating to hear what can be done with technology. Um, I'd like to thank the speakers for giving up their time this evening. I'd like to thank you uh, for attending and listening in for the last hour and uh, seven minutes. I'd also like to thank the CIOB uh, for helping us uh, to run this session. It's great to be uh, supporting them and, and them supporting us. Uh, and, and finally, to, uh, to thank Stuart and Annie uh, from Lambslade for facilitating. And on behalf of, of us all, I'd like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a safe and happy new year. And uh, if they're gonna be, I think there's gonna be uh, some uh, information sent out after this event. So please um, look out for those on your email. In the meantime, keep safe, Merry Christmas, and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.